Why the Cross by Father Edward Lane, Part 2, The Tree of Life, Chapter 6, Second Reading. The intelligence of the Savior was penetrated through and through with the sense of those inspired words that, with tender pathos and delicate poetry, speak of the transcendence of God. Every fiber of his sensitive soul responded to the tones of the great prophet, saying, All nations are before him as if they had no being at all, and are accounted to him as nothing and vanity. Behold, the Gentiles are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the smallest grain of a balance. Behold, the islands are as a little dust. Far from shrinking from the consequences of the truth conveyed in these words of Scripture, he embraced it eagerly with his whole soul. He loved to plunge into his own nothingness as a creature in the presence of the allness of God. In the same act, he delighted in the greatness of God and his own littleness as man. God the Son become incarnate, espoused the lot of fallen humanity. His humility consisted in his abiding firmly in this position and in his willing acquiescence in all its consequences. In consenting to undertake the salvation of mankind, Jesus consented to identify himself with the lot of fallen humanity. The redemption as planned by the Almighty demanded that the Son of Men should not only mingle among men, but that he should become one of them, even more that he should become one with them as their head and chief. By the Incarnation this became Christ's proper, if self-chosen, position in creation. He accepted all the consequences of it with unflinching, undeviating, and unfailing fortitude. His humility did not allow him to evade any of those consequences, however harsh. To abide in his position, he had to forego many of his rightful prerogatives. He was God and could claim the rights of God. He made no such claim. He was a man undefiled, wholly innocent, flawlessly just. He could have considered himself entitled to be dealt with by men and circumstances as such. He did not allow himself to do so. In order to redeem, he accepted the position of the head of the rebellious and fallen race. In his love for men, he accepted their condition and all its disabilities apart from moral evil. He consented to be treated by events and by the interplay of human passions like his fellows. He shared man's lot completely and set himself before them as an example in not indulging in sullen revolt against the grievous disabilities that weigh upon fallen mankind. Though himself unfallen, Christ was as humble in submission to divine providence in all the details of his earthly career as if he were really a fallen creature. In this he showed himself as humble as his fellow mortals showed themselves proud. Though sharing in Adam's fault and guilt, men in their ignorant and insane pride claim to be dealt with by circumstances as if they were as innocent and as divine as Christ. They rail against the conditions of their own making as did the unrepentant thief on the cross. Though laboring under the consequences of original sin, they aspire to the prerogatives of God, to his independence and his impassibility, though not, as Bossuet ironically remarks after St. Augustine, 
to his sanctity and his magnanimity. Jesus was well aware of the kind of world into which he penetrated in his mission of salvation. He knew that his justice would not be esteemed and that his sinlessness would not be revered. He did not need to experience that his unchallenged perfection of character and conduct, so far from securing him immunity from suffering, would but involve him in bitter conflict. The Savior had no illusions about the quote-unquote indefinite perfectibility of men through reason and science. His penetrating glance plumbed the utmost depths of human malice. Jesus, says St. John, did not trust himself unto them, for that he knew all men. And because he needed not that any man give testimony of man, for he knew what was in man. His very goodness could not but provoke aversion and hatred in the soul that breathes the spirit of the original revolt against the supreme good. Having placed himself deliberately in a world where the light of justice was eclipsed and dark passions raged without control, the Savior knew that he would be dealt with unjustly and that in proportion to his justice. That was his freely chosen lot. He did not murmur at or rebel against it. To clamor to be above or outside the essential conditions of one's destiny is an effect of pride. Christ's humility retained him in the destiny of the defiled. Having, in a spirit of devotedness to man and love for God, flung himself into the turbulent sea of angry human passions, he did not cry out against the buffetings he received, nor did he rail against the rulings of divine providence. There is an uncompromising finality about the intellectual attitude of Jesus. The absolute sovereignty of God was for him a ruling principle. The foregoing considerations show in what aspect the new head of the human race was like and in what aspect unlike his fellows. He shared their mortality. He did not share their convictions. With the modern decay of the sense of the supernatural, there is to be observed a growing tendency to dwell almost exclusively on the affective or the will aspect of Christ's character. The intellectual side is but slightly, if at all, touched upon by writers who are without faith in his divinity. Among them there is a pronounced tendency to represent the historic Christ as in no way a dogmatic Christ. Now what may be discerned in Jesus as more characteristic of him than his gentleness and mercy is a certain serene intellectuality. There is a quality of crystal clearness accompanied by an uncompromising finality about his thought. In the intellectual sphere there is no tolerance in him. For him it is yea and nay and one is not allowed to shade over into the other in a way beloved of moderns. At the center of his conceptual universe is fixed the conviction that God was all and that man of himself was nothing. It was a cardinal principle with him that the highest of creatures could be nothing but the servant of God, with no rights except those of total service. Far would it be from his mind to repudiate the words of the inspired writer concerning the Messiah. Behold my servant, I have given my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Christ was uncompromising in his assertion that all human affairs, personal, social, and political, should have as their regulating principle the mind and the will of God. 
This unyielding adamantine quality of Christ's views of the relation of human affairs to God exasperated his contemporaries as the reiteration of the same views by his church continues to exasperate men all through the ages. Those proud and self-seeking men of affairs who listened to him dashed themselves in fury against Christ's intellectual position and seethed with rage as they found that they could not, either by flattery or menace, dislodge him from it. He could not but hold them wrong if they preferred to the declared will of God their own views and traditions as the regulative principles of their public and private life. He said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God for your tradition? You have made void the commandment of God for your tradition. It was a particular instance that called forth this reproof. But, as usual, the words of Christ have a universal import. This intransigent vindication of the absolute and all-pervading sovereignty of God in human affairs was at the very heart of the conflict between Christ and his contemporaries. It is at the very heart of the conflict in which the church is ever engaged with the temporal powers Jesus worshipped a God of divine and transcendent proportions. Men would worship a God dwarfed to their own miserable conceptions. In his reproach to the Pharisees, Jesus placed his finger on an inveterate evil tendency in proud human nature, namely the tendency to reject God unless he can be contracted to fit into man's petty, rational preconceptions and his purblind notions of the congruous in things. Someone has remarked with cutting, though appropriate irony, that God in the beginning made men to his own image, and that, in process of time, man repaid the compliment by making God to his the Jews turned against the Savior when he refused to accommodate himself to their narrow views of the divine purpose in life, a consequence of their unworthy views of the divinity. The absolute dependence on and subjection to God, which sprang from man's creaturehood, was for Christ the essential truth to be presupposed in all interpretations of the economy of men's dealings with God. This truth was for him the foundation stone of the whole edifice of religion. For this was I born, and for this I came into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth said Jesus to the Roman governor. The central and pivotal truth that Christ was appointed to maintain and vindicate was that God is Lord and King over all creatures and that from his hands he, the Savior, holds his kingship. Man's pride tends to whittle down the absoluteness of God's claims. He presumes to define the limits within which the Almighty is to exercise control over human affairs. The children of the first Adam, in direct opposition to the second Adam, ever seek to restrict God's right, to put limitations to his overlordship, and to set qualifications to their own subjection to him. They claim to withdraw whole spheres of human activity from his authority. They resent, as an intrusion, his interference beyond limits they prescribe. To Jesus, this was the wrong of wrongs, the supreme falsehood, the flat contradiction of the truths it was his office to champion.
Christ's life was the living expression of this great truth, that God is supreme and absolute Lord. It was this that drew upon Christ the frenzied hatred of his contemporaries. But with humility, he stood rooted in the position that he saw to be his and that he saw too to be that of all men. Their pride spent itself fruitlessly on the rock of his humility. He did not quail before the storm that he created, for true humility inspires utter fearlessness. The Christian virtue is not the nerveless, spineless, spiritless thing that it is supposed by those who rail at it as destructive of human dignity. Christ was humble, yet no one could surpass him in courage and dignity. He was humble, yet he was truly great, not in spite of his humility, but because of it. The true greatness and the perfect freedom of men have their source in perfect subordination to God. To be humble is to be true to what one is in thought and to have conduct based upon that thought. Christ was the personification of truth. Satan is Satan, or the adversary, because he stood not in the truth. Pride is the mark of Satan, and of all those who, in greater or less measure, swerve from the essential truth preached by Christ. There could be but one issue to the conflict between Christ and the world, as there was no possibility of compromise. His humanity was crushed under the weight of opposition. Standing in the very center of reality, Christ saw all things in proper perspective and in their right proportions. He had an exquisite sense of balance and measure. His enemies, viewing everything through the distorting medium of their pride, saw all things out of proportion. To them the interests of men were magnified exceedingly, and the interest of God dwarfed correspondingly. The antagonist of the servant of Jehovah merited the reproach he addressed to them. If God were your father, you would indeed love me, for from God I proceeded and came. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth the words of God. Therefore you hear them not, because you are not of God. For Christ there could be no such thing as compromise with the world ranged against God. There could be no fellowship between light and darkness. He knew well to what this uncompromising attitude of his committed him. He saw that it was inevitable that his unyielding humility should call forth the most violent explosions of the intolerance of pride. He was not blind as to the fate to which he was committing his followers during all time when he said to them, That which I speak to you in the dark, speak ye in the light, and that which you hear in the ear, preach ye upon the housetops, and fear ye not them that kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that can destroy both body and soul into hell. Jesus was not as one addressing from a position of safety a stirring call to others to face death without fear. He was an exemplar of the fortitude he inculcated, the foremost in facing the fate to which he exhorted his followers. He entered the conflict provoked by his doctrine, armed only with his innocence and humility. His enemies opposed him inflamed with hate and equipped with all the resources of malice. 
the Almighty withdrew from his servant the protection of the divinity. There could be only one issue to such a struggle. Christ's humanity was crushed to death. He could not yield the position to which he was assigned by his humility. His stand was in the truth, and he was cut down where he stood. It was as son of man that Jesus suffered. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross. The Savior himself declared that humility was the distinguishing feature of his human character. That humility consisted in his holding himself firmly in the position that was his through his consenting to be head of the sinful race of mankind. Pride is the radical evil in fallen human nature. It is an unjustifiable aspiration after an excellence that is not one's due. In Satan and in Adam, it prompted an attempt to usurp the prerogatives of the Almighty. It inspired no ambition to emulate His holiness. Christ's humility was the very antithesis to their pride. It sprang from a profound reverence toward God. It dictated thought and action consonant with the position of the scheme of things that Jesus made his own. The pride of fallen man was in irreconcilable opposition to the humility of Christ. The shock of the two was inevitable. It resulted in the death of the Son of Man.